This is Dane Holstrom, Divorce Authority. We're going to be talking about a lot of different subjects in family law. There are some important items that I'm required to share with you so that you understand the limited purpose of my going over all of this information with you. No matter what the specific topic, it's very important for you to understand that this information is not intended as legal advice for any specific person or any specific type or actual case. My sharing this information with you is not designed to create an attorney-client relationship. Everybody's case is different and nobody's results are the same. Just because we may discuss what happened in some other client's case that may in fact sound similar to yours or some other situation does not suggest that your case or the results would be the same or even similar. The discussion of specific cases are fictionalized and may not be real clients or cases. The purpose of these podcasts is to help you understand the framework of how these issues are decided, provide you a better understanding of the process, and hopefully give you insight as to how you might prepare and conduct yourself and your case to get a better result. There is absolutely no substitute for a consultation or hiring a competent, trained family law attorney, and I encourage you to seek out such an attorney as soon as practical in your case. Divorce Authority is a brand and registered trademark of Holstrom Block & Park, a professional law corporation. I've been practicing family law for 30 years. I've been certified by the state of California as a family law specialist, so I know a thing or two about divorce. I'm Dane Holstrom, and I am the Divorce Authority. Today's episode is we're going to talk about creating a plan when you start your divorce. Creating a plan can be anything from simply gathering documents and figuring out your finances. It can be talking to your ex in an amicable situation. It can be creating an emergency escape bag with an emergency safety plan in a case of domestic violence. There's a broad spectrum of different plans for different circumstances and one size absolutely does not fit all. So when you hear these suggestions and ideas, please understand that this is a broad, general approach to the whole situation, but you really should talk to an attorney about what plan works best for you in your situation. There are three types of planning to be done in a soon-to-be divorce. It's often not something that comes along spontaneously. It's something that is working just like a relationship as it's winding down and maybe one party feels it, both parties feel it, but it's often everybody knows it. It's, it's the elephant in the room. And sometimes it's a spontaneous event. Sometimes it's a severe or serious incident of domestic violence. Uh, it may, sometimes it occurs because of the unknown infidelity of the other, par other party. There's lots of issues that create them. For those situations where it is amicable, it is important that you create a plan that you can approach the other parent, especially if you have children, and work out a plan. Who's going to live in the house? How are we going to share the children? Are we going to live close together so we can accommodate the kids? All these kind of general ideas. On the other extreme is the domestic violence situation. And that's where you got to get your stuff and go. That's where you don't share any of your ideas, any of your plans. You make an escape plan, you prepare for the safety of yourself and your children, and you get the hell out. Again, planning with an attorney. There in domestic violence, it's critical to have a plan because getting to court might take months. It may take months to get you support. It may take months for you to get custody orders. So you got to have a plan before you start the process. In between domestic violence and very amicable, we have situations where, the, again, the relationship is merely eroded. But there are issues of trust that may prevent you or, or tell you that you shouldn't possibly share some information with your, again, soon-to-be ex-spouse. In those situations, what you should be doing is classic planning, which is make a plan. Are you going to try to stay in the home or are you going to leave? Are you planning on relocating to another area? Again, part of this obviously depends on whether or not you have children together. But in all of these cases, you should be doing more comprehensive planning. We're going to talk about the planning by talking about different categories of planning to be done. Again, keep in mind, again, we'll talk about domestic violence in, in a separate episode. But at the same time, uh, it is very much a theme throughout all of the planning. In fact, every aspect of a divorce in California today. 
First one is, again, living situation. I never recommend to parties that they continue to live in the same house while they are going through a divorce. And the simple reason is, two, number one, it's horribly emotionally unhealthy, usually. Either one party or both parties may be seeing other people and it, it's, it's creating perhaps unintended, you know, emotional button pushing and sometimes it's intentional. And all of that raises the specter and possibility of an incident of domestic violence or it creates, in some cases, an opportunity for a false allegation of domestic violence. And I've seen both. Uh, I've seen both many times. So thinking about living in the same house while you're going through divorce, that's just a real bad plan. Sometimes there's no option, and, and I, I certainly understand that, but that should not be your first plan. Second, uh, what am I going to do with money? How am I going to, A, how am I going to be able to, find, uh, to fund my move, my, whether I'm relocating across town or I'm going out to rent a new home or whatever I'm going to do, where's that money going to come from? Well, maybe you have a joint bank account. So do you take all the money out of the joint bank account? Well, that may be an appropriate thing to do, but it could also be really, really bad thing to do. Once again, very important to talk uh, to an attorney about your specific circumstances. There's something called ATROs, and I'll come back to the ATROs in a minute. ATRO, Automatic Temporary Restraining Order. This is not to be confused with a domestic violence restraining order, which is completely different. An ATRO is something that's on the back of one of your divorce papers called a summons, and it says, thou shalt not. And there's a list of several things. The biggest one is, don't be hiding money, don't transfer assets, uh, don't move things around, don't borrow against your house once the divorce is ongoing. It's to protect what is called the status quo. Keep things kind of the way they are. Don't cancel anybody's health insurance. Don't cancel anybody's car insurance. Things like that. Things that can often be, that used to be often done to literally either out of economic necessity or to try to control the conduct of the opposing party. So these atros control a lot of things. This is something you talk to an attorney about. And I'll give an example of a what not to do. So what to do? Is there $20,000 in the savings account? Is it okay for you to take 10? Well, again, your facts might be different, but to be clear, that's probably okay. Under California law, each party has equal right to management control of the funds while the marriage is going, so long as you do it prior to the divorce being filed. You should obviously expect and this is one of the things we always talk to our clients about, foreseeable consequence. What's a foreseeable consequence of you taking half the money in the bank? Well, the first one is, if you didn't have trust issues before, you do now. Because I guarantee you, the other side is going to immediately go to the bank and take the other half. Okay? So if there was a, an amicable thing working at that time, that may end up cutting it off, but you still may want to do that. Again, your circumstances have to dictate what you do. But here's what you don't do. And this, is, this actually happened in a recent case. Other party, apparently on advice of counsel, goes into a partially family-owned business bank account and takes out a million dollars. Transfer it to their own personal account. Well, the theory of that case is their, their argument is that, gee whiz, the atros hadn't taken place yet. I snuck and took the money before we filed, so I'm okay. Well, not necessarily true, because there's a whole other concept called breach of fiduciary duty, and that is a huge consequence of family law today in California, where one spouse takes an asset, sells an asset, does something that doesn't benefit, that actually harms the community, which is the entity that owns all the property. So obviously taking a million dollars from a company account, especially one that is partially owned by somebody who's not part of the marriage, is not a good thing to do. And so that person didn't get real good advice. Um, but at the same time, it's very common in other cases to take part of the money in the bank, part up to half, okay? And again, your case may be different. I'm not saying it's okay for you to take half in every case. Um, it may be that that money was somebody's separate property, which is a whole different asset issue, and then maybe it's not okay. And then you, if you do something wrong, 
what can happen is the other side runs into court to get what's called an ex parte. It simply means, that's obviously Latin, but it, it basically means without the other party, what we're going to do is we're going to go in on an emergency hearing and ask the court to make an emergency order to make that person put the money back. You don't want to escalate the case. And that's something you want to think about and, again, why you need to talk to somebody. But, again, money's a real issue. How am I going to pay the bills after I've got my house set up or whatever I'm going to do? Well, if, again, you're the breadwinner, for now you're okay. You can continue to take your income and pay your bills. But what if the kids are living primarily with the other parent? Well, most parents, regardless, are going to want to make sure their kids and even their soon-to-be ex-spouse are still taken care of. This is a common theme of co-parenting, and I'm going to just diverge for a second. What is good for the parent of your children is good for you. Why? Because it's good for your children. You gotta gotta approach it that way. If it becomes a battle and it becomes a war, you lose sight of what's really, really important, and that is taking care of your kids. It can be a battle. We have a lot of battles. Not every case is amicable. At the same time, we try to give our clients guidance and talk about how to make the choices, what are the economic consequences of the choices, what are the psychological consequences of the choices, the emotional consequences, what are the consequences to the children, and walk through all of those things. And again, this is all part of planning. How do you want to approach this? How do you want it to end? And then create the plan. Again, it takes months to get into court sometimes to get a support order or a custody visitation order. So you're on your own for that period of time. During COVID, it can be even even longer because the courts sometimes are shut down or limited in how they can do things. It's important to have a plan and get good advice to create the plan. Your kids. Again, most importantly, how are we going to share the kids? Well, if, if they're 17 years old, they're going to tell you how it's going to happen. Uh, oftenly. Often that happens that way. Um, at the same time, what if you have smaller kids? Well, obviously, if you have infants and toddlers, you're going to have an issue there. You have an issue with daycare, paying for daycare. You have uh, issues of sharing, whether one parent's work schedule lives and works far apart. All of these become practical issues. Nothing is better for your case than having two competent, rational family law attorneys, one on each side. Why? because if they're both really good family law attorneys, then guess what? They're not throwing gasoline on the fire. They're trying to help their clients reach a reasonable conclusion that doesn't escalate the cost and the emotional hostility of your case. Again, part of the plan. I don't need to talk about those scorched earth cases. Again, we have quite a few of those and we're exceptional, exceptionally strong litigators when it comes to those issues. But it's, that may become part of your plan. If you know your plan is going to be that way because you know your spouse, and I concede, you know your spouse way better than I will ever know them. At the same time, we've been doing this a long time, I've seen a lot of personality profiles, a lot of relationship dynamics, and we can give you good advice. Part of advising a client in making a plan involves listening to you and what is important to you. And that's why you get that guidance. We do not tell you what to do, ever. There are attorneys that will do that. We do not. We tell you the consequences. We let you make the life-affecting decisions that are going to affect you and your children. But we make it, we do that in an environment where you know and can foresee all of the, the potential consequences when you make those choices. Safety. What's your plan for safety? Do you have a get out quick bag? Do you have uh, running away money? Running away money is a little different than walking away money. Walking away money is the money you have for your first and last for the apartment, stuff like that. Running away money is money to get on an airplane. Run, running away money is, is money th that you can support yourself and your children maybe in, your, in a domestic violence shelter. It's a safety issue and it's important therefore to have a plan. Okay, um, even if the plan is created while the emergency is going on. Uh, economic support, we talked about from both sides. How are you as the breadwinner or sole earner in the house going to make sure that you and still your family is taken care of? As, as the person who earns the money, 
you don't want to play hardball. You don't want to cut them off. You don't want to uh, leave them destitute. That will create such a horrible situation, not only um, create a potential wedge between you and your children, but it will also make you look awful in the eyes of the court when you do wind up in court. There is not a lot worse, other than of course domestic violence and things like that, than somebody that goes into court having cut off their spouse and children for the several months before they got into court to get a support order. So you really want to be conscious of that. And again, competent advice can make sure you don't make those kinds of mistakes. You may not be paying as much as you're going to be obligated to pay, but giving something to show that you're trying and you do care about your children is critical. Who's going to use which assets? Uh, very common people jointly own a house, they jointly own a car, they may jointly own multiple cars. In that situation, this plan may be as simple as you keep driving the car you have and I'll keep driving the car that I have. Who's going to live in the house? You've already heard my thoughts about staying in the house together while a divorce is going on. That is just not a good call. It's not a safe call. So who's going to stay in the house? And if one party's not going to stay in the house, where are they going to live? Well, are they going to rent a room? Well, wait a second. How are they going to be able to have meaningful visits with the kids and custodial time if they're living in somebody's spare bedroom? It's just not going to work. Other than house and cars, again, we've talked about possibly working out a division of some assets. We've got to talk about maintaining insurance, clearly car insurance and health insurance. And again, we've talked about the atros. But again, good planning, good advice. What would happen to a, a wage earner who has the whole family on their health insurance who decides unilaterally that he's going to take the, the mother off or, or father off of their health insurance? Well, number one, that would result in an emergency hearing, and so that person would probably be ordered to pay the other person's attorney's fees. On top of that, it would also make them look horribly bad in the eyes of the court for as long as this case goes on. I can tell you when I have those cases where I'm on the other side of somebody who does something that precipitous and that harmful, I bring it up every hearing because I'm just going to remind the court what a jerk this person is, okay? Mother, father, doesn't matter. If they do something like that that is that short-sighted, that will carry, stay with you for the life of your case. So you, you want to get good advice and not commit those kind of cardinal sins of, of divorce and separation. Um, hiring legal counsel. You need to think about that. There are lots of different ways to go. Again, part of the planning is critical. How do you hire legal counsel? Well, obviously the most common way people find attorneys is on the internet. I encourage you to Talk to your friends, people that you have trust and confidence in, people that have shared experiences with different types of divorces. And be, be cognizant of that, that somebody else who has a million dollar divorce where they've spent you know, years fighting about lots and lots of assets may recommend an attorney, but that may not be the right attorney or the right firm for you. And maybe you're looking for an attorney who's more empathetic, or you want an attorney to tell you what to do, or a variety of scenarios. You've got to find somebody that fits you. To some degree, it's like finding a therapist. Um, that's really a unique fit. And that's another thing, by the way. I encourage everybody to get some kind of mental health counseling and therapy when they're going through this process, just to get the skills and the tools to deal with the stress and the anxiety that comes from not knowing what's going to happen. Uh, but again, um, back to the issues of hiring counsel. If there's domestic violence, you want an attorney that knows, that has an understanding of how domestic violence works, not in general, but in your, your courthouse, your county courthouse. Now we have offices all over Southern California, but to be clear, we have specific attorneys that work in specific courthouses and have been in front of the same judges for years. Oftentimes they cycle the judges every two or three years. Sometimes judges have been there for 10 years. And it's very common to know exactly their predilections. For instance, we might assign a particular attorney to the case because of who the judge is and who the judge might like or not like. That's part of finding the attorney and getting a plan. Uh, having the resources that you need obviously is important to the attorney. Uh, the, some attorneys charge retainers of ten or twenty or fifty thousand dollars, and some attorneys are less expensive. In my experience, you get what you pay for. And that's an adage, but it's frankly very, very true. Don't get caught up in, in that. We're going to have a separate episode on finding the right attorney. But be aware of retainers. Be aware of hourly rates. 
But most importantly, really, I encourage you to, to go by not only what you hear, uh, but what you feel. Um, and, and that's really very, very important. Don't get caught up uh, too much. I mean, certainly there's some value in online reviews, but don't get caught up in that. I will tell you that that is very prone to manipulation. And so we have, we've had over the years, we've had opposing parties uh, post uh, negative reviews on a recurring basis, uh, saying very, very bad things about us in the guise of being a client. And it's not true. And I know that that happens for other attorneys as well. Uh, find an attorney experience geography. Don't hire an, an attorney from San Francisco. I'm, I'm obviously exaggerating to make a point to represent you in Orange County. Don't hire an attorney from Orange County to represent you in Riverside County. It, it, you got to have somebody who knows what's going on. Domestic violence. We're going to have a complete separate episode coming up on domestic violence. But as far as the planning, the way most courts do it is you can get a domestic violence restraining order typically within 24 hours of your request. Sometimes it's the same day. That's critical part of your plan. Why? Because in a domestic violence restraining order, if you're able to get a restraining order immediately, that creates a safety plan, that creates a temporary custody plan, that creates a temporary housing plan. It, it takes a lot into consideration very, very quickly. It does not address the financial situation much more quickly than without. Uh, so, but it's important to have somebody who can explain all of these steps to you so that when you're making your plan, you can say, okay, I've got enough money that's gonna last me for two months, or what, what, is, what do I do when that runs out? What is my plan? What's my backup plan? It's important that you know you're going to have these issues and somebody that's experienced with doing it can walk you through all of the tips, all of the traps for your circumstances. Documents. Whenever you get divorced, you've got to gather up your, to some degree, your life history. Your life history relates to all of the issues we've already talked about. It may relate to your kids. Maybe one parent is saying, I'm the primary parent. The other one's saying, no, I'm the primary parent. And then the first parent comes back and says, well, wait a second. You work at 6 a.m., you have to show up to your job that's an hour and a half away, probably two hours in traffic. How could you possibly be the primary parent? How do you document that? Well, you may have to get the work schedule, okay? Is that something your attorney can help you with? Absolutely. The other party says, my income is only $500 a month. Well, wait a second. The bank statements show that you're depositing $5,000 a month. Again, gather the bank statements. Gather the bank documents. Most people can get them online. If it's a situation where you can't get them online because, for instance, you're not on that account and we don't want you hacking into your spouse's accounts, don't ever do that. That's a crime. Don't do that. But can you talk to your attorney and have your attorney subpoena those bank records so you have them before the hearing? Absolutely. And that's part of the plan. Again, create the plan so that everything is ready when you need it. Insurance policies, um, your will. Do you have a family a living trust? Do you have a will? Um, well, one of the common questions about a living trust, and, and it's, it's very ironic, people walk in getting a divorce from their spouse. And for those of you who don't necessarily know about it, it may not affect you, but a will is simply a device by which you can leave your stuff to somebody else when you die. A living trust is similar, but it's very often, in the case of a married couple, there's a joint trust. And a joint trust typically says, that if husband dies, wife gets everything, and if wife dies, husband gets everything. That's kind of, that attitude kind of changes when you're going through a divorce. And I look across the table and I say to a, to a, a party that's, that's getting divorced, and I say, and uh, who, does ev who gets everything in the event of your death? Oh, shoot, my spouse does. Well, is that what you want? Well, no, I really don't. I want to make sure my kids are taken care of, or no, I want it to go to somebody else. So again, that's part of your plan. Why? Because you can revoke a living trust. You can revoke a will pretty much instantaneously in California. Sometimes there's notice required. Again, get competent advice. And you may be able to have time to create a new living trust where your share of the family assets can be divided. Again, all part of the plan. Again, the atros may kick in here and block your ability to do certain things, but competent counsel can walk you through that minefield very easily. 
it's important to know what you need. It's also important to have the living trust. Why? Because most people list all of their material assets in that trust and it'll provide your attorney with a guide, at least an outline of what was listed at the time the trust was created. Come in with copies of your credit card statements, copies of other things. Sometimes there's issues where we find out that one of the parties has been living a double life and as in one case that I'm working on has uh, uh, had an apartment in, you know, in another city and was paying an, another unnamed person thousands of dollars a month and the spouse didn't even know about it. And uh, that's stuff that's very important for you and for your attorney to ultimately find. So part of a making a plan is gathering all of the documents, the statements, your will or your trust. Uh, oh, electronic information, passwords. It's pretty important when you're planning a divorce that you make sure that your passwords are secure. I'm not saying get your spouse's passwords. Not okay to do that, okay? What I am saying is that you should make sure your passwords are secure, whether it's to your email, whether it's to your login for the bank, credit cards, whatever it is. It's not uncommon for people to have the same password for every account, and of course their spouse knows it. So I, I recommend everybody change to new secure passwords so that they can have at least the security of their privacy of their information. Um, your cell phone. It's very common for families to have shared cell phone accounts. Well, guess what? That's probably not a good idea if you're going through a divorce because even if they're not trying to, they look at a bill and they find out you're calling a number on a regular basis. They may call the number, okay? Creates more problems, more hostility. It's very important to, and it doesn't have to be like dropping an ax on a log. It's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is you need to start moving in a separate direction, and that means creating an identity that is separate and apart from your former spouse. Doing that includes making sure that you have your own identity and your own privacy. That's very, very important. I have these thoughts that I've coined as Dane's rules. Some of them relate to the practice of law, and some of them relate to the operation of a law firm. One of Dane's rules is that when you leave your home, you should approach it from a perspective of you are never going to be able to go back to get your stuff. You should plan that. Why? Because managing your expectations is a big part of what a good attorney will do in educating you. And if you leave your house and you've left your passport, uh, your personal mementos, photographs of the kids, stuff that's personal, sentimental, important to you, your third grade report card if you really nailed math that year, whatever it was, okay? It is important that you take that stuff with you because in my experience, unless you have one of those really amicable situations that stays amicable all the way through, here's what's going to happen. And it also deals with valuable items too. You, call, you go to your attorney and you say, okay, I want to get my Rolex. And so your attorney calls the other attorney, etc. And they say he'd like to get his Rolex. And then you hear back through channels, what Rolex? Okay. Bottom line, you should assume that you'll never see it again. I, not, I don't approach it from that way. We will fight like the devil to get your Rolex back. But as far as making a plan... It is better to take it with you and not create that problem. What do I mean by that? Well, I've heard, no, you took that with you. I've heard, we had a burglary. Here's the police report. I've heard, Rolex? You never had a Rolex. And that applies equally to your third grade report card, that sentimental picture, and everything else. So while it may make sense, not to take your personal, sentimental, or valuable items with you. Um, we encourage you to do that. Now again, this is subject to the automatic temporary restraining orders. I'm not asking you to remove. If you're really in love with your bidet, you got to leave it. I'm sorry. That would violate the atros. Don't take it with you. Okay? At the same time, by the way, I'm in love with my bidet. Uh, it, it, you got to use common sense. Okay? And common sense says, don't take the crystal chandelier. Take a picture of the crystal chandelier when you're leaving, okay? 
but do take those personal sentimental items that are sentimental to you. If they're sentimental to both of you, be cautious, be considerate, work it out. But if it's your personal stuff, I'm concerned that if you don't take it with you, you'll never see it again. So be aware of that. Now, to summarize, make a plan. Sometimes it's an emergency and you can't make a comprehensive plan, but you make it on the fly. Yes, you make it up as you go along, but you make it up as you go along with insight, with knowledge. You don't just throw a dart in the dark and hope it works out. If you make a misstep early on in your case that can hurt you, it can hurt your kids for many months or perhaps years to come. Talk to an attorney early on. Even if you're just thinking about what might happen, I encourage you to talk to competent legal counsel. And again, we'll have a separate episode on how to, how to, how to pick that right attorney for you. But an attorney should not tell you what to do, in my opinion. An attorney should give you the tools so you can make the decisions that you know are best for you and your family. Plan for your, your, your children, the economics, the money, the housing, the stuff as best as you can. Start gathering up all the documents you can. I'm not saying necessarily take exclusive possession of things. I am saying make copies. It's easy to make copies of things. I'm talking about take those copies away from the house. Don't put them in the trunk of your car, okay? What happens when your spouse borrows that car one day, okay? Keep them somewhere safe and secure so that when you're ready to do it, you're ready to do it. Work with an attorney when you're ready to do it so you can create the safe plan that works just for you. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you found the information helpful. If you're listening or watching, you're probably going through a tough time and we certainly understand that. If you'd like more information, download our ebook, Divorce 101 at divorceauthority.com or follow us at Divorce Authority. I'm Dane Holstrom, and when I do becomes I don't, turn to Divorce Authority.